So one day, I was casually walking along from Ardoin to Sears Village, thinking about how I could please everyone with these videos, and I found that I'd stumbled into a dark cave and was looking upon the lifeless corpse of one of RuneScape's most iconic characters, the god known as Guffix. How did he get here? Why did he die? And what kind of stories had he lived in his life? Let's find out together. Oh, and before we start, I'm going to be talking about this stuff with wild abandon. Consider this a spoiler warning. As a god, Guffix stood for balance. A lot of people take this to mean that Guffix was a being of peace, but this was not always the case. He desired for a world in which mortals lived in tandem with their environment, and was not above taking actions to balance the world if needed, as is shown by his founding of the Void Knights, an aggressive outfit designed to counteract the peaceful nature of the Guffixian druids. He had zero interest in ruling as a god. In fact, he despised it so much that during his life, he snuck away to sleep for millennia in the hopes that his followers would forget all about him. I'll get to that later though. He was an extremely powerful being, capable of opening portals between worlds, shape-shifting, and oppressing all of the other gods on Gilinor without really breaking a sweat. As a mortal, Guffix belonged to a race of creatures living on the planet of Naragan, known as the Naragi. Life on Naragan was a simple one for Guffix. He carved out a peaceful life for himself with a wife and daughter, named Fraji and Argi, respectively. Sadly, Fraji died early on in Argi's life, meaning that Guffix had to raise his daughter alone. Peace would not last for long, though. A portal was opened near the capital of Ascroft, and who should come through it but everyone's favourite blue bastard, the newly ascended Sarah Doman. If you want more specific information about Big Blue, then click on the eye icon to go check out my video on him. Young and foolish, Sarah Doman staked a claim to Naragan and began waging war on any of the natives who dared defy him. A lot of Naragi fled to refugee camps, but Guffix refused to move, instead electing to hide his daughter in the basement of his own house. Saradoman's war on the planet began to attract the attention of other gods, namely Tusker, aka the Devourer, a giant boar goddess. Years into the conflict, Guffix ran into Tusker and stood his ground like a total boss. Before the very mortal Guffix could be smushed, one of Tusker's rivals, a god known as Skargaroth, stabbed her in the eye. Tusker thrashed about, Skargaroth fell, Guffix's house and basement were crushed, Argi died. In grief, anger, and shock, Guffix grabbed Skargaroth's elder sword and used it to stab Tusker's other eye. Now blind, Tusker fled. Skargaroth didn't get so lucky. As his own sword was plunged into his back, Guffix absorbed the dying god's power and ascended to godhood. With everyone he ever loved dead, Guffix left Naragan to travel the multiverse. So Guffix travelled far and wide on his journeys before ending up on the perfect, empty world of Gilinor. I'm sure the fact that Gilinor was home to several elder artefacts such as the Horn, the Staff and the Stone of Jazz had nothing to do with his decision to stay there. Guffix took it upon himself to begin populating the world with species from other planets that were selected for their ambivalent nature, neither being particularly good or particularly evil. He'd seen firsthand the damage that gods could do, and wanted to build a world in which the inhabitants could live independently away from the influence of gods. Guffix was also responsible for the existence of runestones. As a present to the new human settlers, he crafted the Anima Mundi, or Soul of the World, into runestones with which mortals could control magic. Now, I'm a big fan of magic, so if someone gave me the means with which to control the elements, I'd probably become a big fan of theirs too. Which is exactly what happened. Guffix developed a large following of worshippers which he hated. His ascension had been a mistake and he didn't want to be held up on a pedestal. In response, he buried himself deep in the earth and went to sleep, planning to sleep for so long that by the time he awoke, the inhabitants of Gilinor would have forgotten all about him. Guffix's plan went almost exactly the opposite way of how he wanted. Soon after he went to sleep, gods of all ideologies arrived on Gilinor and began to do what they seemingly do best, which is wage war. 
For thousands of years, gods such as Zaros, Bandos, and Saradomen vied for power and territory, oftentimes manipulating the mortals of the world to fight for them. This all culminated in an era of history known as the God Wars, which saw the combined army of Saradomen, Bandos, and Armadil trying to defeat the force of the newly ascended god Zamorak. More on how Zamorak ascended can be found by clicking on this video here. At one point near the end of the war, a cornered Zamorak obliterated the kingdom of Ferinfri, turning it into a desolate wasteland. Such a horrendous act of horror cut the world deep, causing the Anima Mundi to cry out in agony. Guffix heard this cry, and awoke to a world not dissimilar to the one he knew back on the Ragan. I doubt he was surprised to see Saradomen at the centre of the conflict. He has a habit of destroying worlds wherever he goes. Kafix then systematically set about banishing the various gods from Gilinor, using force if necessary. Once the world was god-free, he erected a magical barrier around the world, preventing other gods from setting foot back on Gilinor. Some gods, however, were excluded, like Brassica Prime and the Menophyte Demigods. Possibly Guffix saw something in these characters of these guys that convinced him to make an exception, or it could have been that he just viewed them as too weak to really make any kind of a dent. I don't know. He hid the Stone of Jazz away where he thought no one would ever find it, and once again returned to a slumber. I probably gave it away at the start of the video, but poor old Guffix was too good for this world. Over the years of godlessness that followed the creation of the Edicts, many individuals with many allegiances tried their best to bring their chosen god back to Gilinor, all to no avail. During the Fifth Age, a historian known as Orlando Smith managed to discover the cave in which Guffix slept. The adventurer is hired by Orlando to help in exploring the cave. During your journey into it, an alarm is tripped which activates the security automatons under the control of Cress. The alarm had not only triggered security, but had alerted factions from all over Gilinor about the disturbance. Soon followers of all of the major gods turned up hoping to kill Guffix in order to be rid of the edicts. The adventurer teams up with some Gaphixians, such as Juna, to battle opponents such as Criara, Commander Ziliana, and Krosusaroth. <laughs> Eventually abandoned Majorat Lo to Zaros, the god that Zamorak defeated during the Second Age, appeared and a full-blown argument broke out between the factions, with the adventurer being forced to make a decision on which faction to support. During the ruckus, Sliske, a Zaro supporter, crept inside of Guffix's chamber and used the Elder Staff that he had squirreled away somewhere to mortally wound Guffix. Sliske escaped without being captured. As Guffix stood dying, he confided in the adventurer that he let Sliske kill him. He could have stopped Sliske at any point, but in truth, he's wanted to die for millennia, painfully aware of the irony that as long as he lives, Gilinor can never truly be god free. He appoints the adventurer as his wild guardian, and gives them a power that prevents them from being affected by the magic of other gods. Guffix says that only a mortal can guide mortals. In the second that he died, the edicts of Guffix broke and rained down upon the world. Saradomen was the first god to see Guffix's dead body, appearing mere seconds after the end of the edicts. So the destruction of the edicts of Guffix ushered in a new age of Gilinor the Age of Gods, which is ongoing and has included all the major gods returning to the planet. When a god dies, their power is dispersed across the world. In Guffix's case, his power is so immense that his energy and memories took on physical form as wisps. Coincidentally, like in the God Wars, the death of Guffix wreaked havoc with the Anima Mundi, and rifts began to open up all over the world's surface. Some bright sparks figured out that placing this energy back into the rifts might go some way towards healing the damage, and with this, the skill of divination was born. Now without a leader, the Guffixian faction was left scrambling. A follower is known as Quagamix, Cake Mix, I don't know, started to spread the message of Guffix's real idea that he not be worshipped, instead they began honouring him instead. Those two things sound the same, but they're not. One is worshipping, one is honouring. 
Those are different things. Sickened by what he viewed as just a change in semantics, a druid known as Bean went on to found the faction of the Godless, a faction whose aims are as in line with Guthix's as you could possibly get. Gods do not belong on Gilinor, and the Godless will do everything in their power to remove them. That brings an end to the tale of Guthix. There's plenty more to explore, some of which I'll probably get to in the future, but for now, that seems like enough. What do you think of Guthix? Is he your guardian? Or is he just an idealistic narcoleptic? Personally, he gets my support, or I mean I would if he wanted it. I dig his message of mortal autonomy. Why shouldn't mortals be in charge of their own destinies? That's a controversial topic though. Be sure to sound off in the comments about your feelings on the matter. If you made it this far, then please click the like button and subscribe for more videos like this one. I've been Vimoria, thank you for watching.